Hi, you're watching Nursing A. Today we're going to talk about hepatitis and key concepts of liver inflammation. First, let's discuss the function of a healthy liver. The liver is not only a filter, it performs over 400 vital functions within the body. Every body system is in some way dependent upon the liver. The liver aids in blood storage and filtration, the production of digestible salts through the removal of bilirubin. It maintains a safe balance of clotting factors by regulating the rate of synthesis and removal of those clotting factors. And it helps metabolize carbs, fats, and proteins, as well as detoxification of the bloodstream and the body and storage of fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and of iron. Hepatitis is a widespread inflammation of the liver cells that impacts children and adults. This inflammation results in impaired liver function and therefore a buildup of toxins. The inability to produce adequate proteins like albumin and clotting factors and the inability to store blood, fat-soluble vitamins, and glycogen. Inflammation around the bile channels can cause obstructive jaundice. The most common causes of acute hepatitis are viral infections with the hepatitis viruses. Secondary infections can also occur from virus such as the Epstein-Barr virus, the herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster, and the cytomegalovirus. Toxic and drug-induced hepatitis occurs from exposures to industrial toxins, alcohol, and drugs, and those can occur through inhalation, enteral exposure like ingestion, or parenteral exposure like IV root. And then anatomic causes of hepatitis include things like biliary atresia, which we'll talk about in the cirrhosis lecture. Autoimmune disease can also cause liver inflammation. There are two types. Type 1 occurs in adolescent females, usually with diabetes type 1, hyperthyroidism, ulcerative colitis, or proliferative glomerulonephritis. Type 2 typically occurs in females between the ages of 2 and 14. Chronic hepatitis occurs when the inflammation has lasted more than six months. It is most often the result of the hepatitis B virus or the hepatitis C virus infection. It's important to note that 25% of people with chronic hepatitis will develop cirrhosis and or liver cancer. The classic acute presentation of hepatitis can occur regardless of the strain A, B, C, or E. There are uh, three phases. The first is called the prodromal or anecteric phase, and anecteric means without jaundice, so we don't see jaundice in that first phase. The person will experience flu-like signs and symptoms. All viral strains, so again, regardless if it's A or E, B or C, will experience anorexia, malaise, lethargy, fatigue. So just kind of those general flu-like signs and symptoms. Hepatitis B, though, oftentimes will also have fever, nausea, vomiting, right upper quadrant or epigastric pain, joint pain, even muscle aches and skin rashes. So hepatitis B has a kind of more serious prodromal presentation than the others. The icteric phase or the jaundice phase, we see jaundice of the skin um, and sclera, right? So icterus also um, can refer to the sclera and then dark urine and pale stools. Pruritus also starts to occur during the icteric phase or the jaundice phase as there is a buildup of toxins within the body. In the post-icteric phase, so after the jaundice has resolved, 
is the acute hepatitis, the liver heals itself, it resolves within six months, and the cells will actually regenerate if they can. In the chronic hepatitis patient, the LFTs remain elevated chronically and progressive liver damage occurs. So if the infection remains past that six month mark, the person is said to have chronic hepatitis. What is the connection between jaundice and clay colored stools? So we said the liver is responsible for breaking down old red blood cells, and then it recycles the bilirubin and turns it into bile. And those bile salts are then stored within the gallbladder and they aid in digestion. The stools actually get their brown color from the bile salts. So a liver that is not filtering properly will cause a rise in the serum or the blood bilirubin levels and a decrease in gastric bile. So the stools don't get stained that you know yellow brown color and instead that yellow brown bilirubin remains in the bloodstream and starts to stain the rest of the body. So the skin and the sclera and the mucous membranes. Hepatitis A and E are very similar in transmission and presentation, so we're going to talk about those two together. They are spread by the fecal oral route, which means the feces contamination gets into the mouth somehow. This can be uh, from not washing your hands after going to the bathroom and handling food. It can be from contaminated water supply, or it can be from any activities where the mouth touches the anus. Um, the presentation is the typical kind of GI bug or what we refer to as Montezuma's Revenge or Traveler's Diarrhea because these are frequently seen in countries outside of the United States. Um, it, hepatitis A and E both only cause acute illness. They do not progress to chronic disease. Prevention, there is a vaccine for hepatitis A and currently it is recommended for all infants um, from the CDC, but for adults who didn't have it as a child, it's typically recommended for traveling. Hand washing is key and then avoiding potentially contaminated uh, foods and water. So, you know, certain places when you travel, they tell you only to drink bottled water. Don't drink any uh, drinks that have ice cubes in them. Um, you know, be careful even of foods that have to be washed in the local water, like salads and things like that, um, because uh, these are only destroyed by uh, chlorine bleach and extremely high temperatures, and they're resistant to detergents and acids even. The treatment for these is minimal. There's, it's self-limiting, but things like bismuth, Pepto-Bismol actually can help. Hepatitis B and D are listed together because D is only present in those who are infected with hepatitis B. It piggybacks on the virus and helps with virus replication. And usually we only see this in patients who have chronic hepatitis B infections. This is spread through blood and other potentially infectious material. So like saliva, feces, urine, they come into contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin. And you can see this uh, transmission occur with things like needle sticks, especially in the healthcare environment, unprotected intercourse. It can be transmitted through birth. And anytime there's direct contact with open wounds or blood with um, non-intact skin or mucous membranes. The presentation is that really classic stereotypical disease. And prevention, we do, again, there is a hepatitis B vaccine. It's a series of three vaccines. There is a titer to test to see whether or not you've developed antibodies. Uh, PPE is huge. So um, gloves and condoms are very important in preventing the spread of hepatitis B. And then don't share needles and try to avoid accidental needle sticks. For treatment, if somebody has ex up, uh, exposure, we have a post-exposure plan and um, the hepatitis B vaccine would be given if they hadn't already developed antibodies for hepatitis B, so if they hadn't already been vaccinated. 
antivirals and interferons also can be effective at treating hepatitis B. The majority of people who are exposed to hepatitis B would go on to uh, be able to fight that off themselves. But for those who convert to a chronic hepatitis B, remember the risk is 25% would go on to develop cirrhosis and or liver cancer. Hepatitis C is often asymptomatic until significant liver damage has occurred. The person may experience a mild prodromal phase. They do not have an icteric phase. Um, so they just, you know, have a very long incubation period with mild symptoms and then uh, just this very slow insidious disease as it attacks the body. It is spread blood to blood. It can be from the mother to child during birth, most frequently sharing needles, and that can include uh, blood transfusions, tattoos, and piercings. Um, sharing needles, anything like that. The presentation, again, often asymptomatic. The prevention, there is no vaccine. Um, don't share needles. And the blood bank is now screening blood, but blood that was, screen was not screened before like the 1980s, um, people who had hemophilia were incredibly high risk for developing hepatitis C. Treatment includes antivirals and interferons, and we do have drugs out there that are curing hepatitis C. So we do have drugs that are getting the viral load um, so low that it's undetectable, and we would consider those patients to be cured. When hepatitis B becomes chronic is where we see most of our complications. Neurologically, the patient can develop encephalopathy, insomnia, or somnolence and impaired mentation. Hematologically, there can be bleeding, usually in the GI tract, coagulation disorders from impaired clotting, and thrombocytopenia from spleen involvement. Cardiovascularly, we see edema and ascites from decreased albumin and then um, from you know, the fluid third spacing into the GI tract. On the renal system, we get oliguria, so poor urine output. And then other, we see fever, accumulation of waste products, especially ammonia. And that further contributes to neurological problems. Chronic hepatitis, remember, is linked with the development of cirrhosis and liver cancer. Failure of the liver cells to regenerate coupled with the progressive necrotic process results in what's called fulminant hepatitis. This is a severe acute form of hepatitis with a really high mortality rate. The medical management of hepatitis includes monitoring uh, labs, so checking liver function tests, alkaline phosphatase, serum proteins like albumin and globulins, bilirubin levels, and um, LDH is an enzyme uh, that would go along with the liver function tests. The medications that we use, again, would be like our antivirals and our interferons, but we also can use antiemetics to control the nausea and the vomiting. The diet that they suggest for patients with hepatitis includes moderate fat and moderate protein with high carbohydrate that are like healthy, so fruits and vegetables and whole grains. The patient should eat small frequent meals and avoid alcohol and hepatotoxic medications like Tylenol. They need to supplement vitamins A, D, E, and K, which are fat soluble vitamins that are normally stored in the liver. Exercise should be as tolerated and increased as tolerated low impact, walking is great, and then light resistance training is important as well. Rest is also very critical and you wanna schedule rest. And that also includes resting the liver, so no toxins, um, nothing that would strain the liver even further than it already was. Surgical management of um, hepatitis is usually restricted to patients who have like hepatitis C induced cirrhosis of the liver. So we'll talk more about liver transplant in the cirrhosis lecture, but just so you know, it could get to that point. Cadaver donors are the most common for this type of surgery for these patients. 
and living donors can give a portion of their liver. It's usually the right uh, lobe. Complications of liver transplant, usually um, we see rejection in about the four to 10 day post-op period. And the person has the signs and symptoms of acute hepatitis again, right upper quadrant pain, tachycardia, jaundice, and changes in bile drainage. Anti-rejection meds like cyclosporin can be used to help prevent rejection. Infection is one of our greatest fears though. 80% of patients who receive a liver transplant will develop an infection in that first year. And um, you know that's probably our biggest concern. So my question is, what is the relationship between rejection and infection? I'm using these big dramatic pauses to let you think about the answer. All right, so our anti-rejection drugs are immune suppressing drugs, right? So if we're suppressing the ability of the body to create an immune response to fight off the new liver, we're also creating a um, suppression of the immune response to fight off infection. So anytime we're using anti-rejection drugs, we're increasing the risk of infections, all those opportunistic infections, but just also community acquired infections and kind of our standard infections as well. So last but not least, nursing management of hepatitis. Um, being organized is a really important skill for all medical providers. If you have a solid plan in place before you begin your interaction with the patient, it will help you not miss anything that's really pertinent. For the patient with hepatitis, you want to assess for the common hepatic signs and symptoms, right upper quadrant and abdominal pain, icterus or jaundice, arthralgias, myalgias, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, dark urine, light colored stool, fever, malaise, lethargy, and pruritus. Review the labs for changes in their liver and function tests, clotting factors, bilirubin, ammonia, albumin, and then a lot of education, right? So educate on self-care. For their skin, for pruritus, you wanna use cool water and only a small amount of soap, and then lotions for hydration. Hygiene and hand washing are really important, as well as food safety, safe sex practices, needle safety, and just you know, all around prevention of transmission. So depending on the type of hepatitis they have, you wanna to talk to them about how not to share that with anybody else. Avoid all over-the-counter medications and other medications, especially Tylenol, but anything that's potentially hepatotoxic without talking to your provider before taking it. Avoid alcohol. Rest. Eat frequent small meals, and again, high carb, moderate fat, and moderate protein. Evaluate their knowledge of their condition and their management. Evaluate their current health status. How are they doing? And evaluate their ability for self-care. And then collaborate with whoever needs to be involved to help support them to maintain their independence. As always, thank you for watching and uh, please feel free to drop a comment in the comment section about where you're watching from and uh, hope to see you in future videos. Take care.